Guest in the first segment is Senator Ryan Weld. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Good to be here in studio. Great to have you with us. What brings you to the panhandle today? Uh, just a couple of uh, meetings, campaign-related. Uh, yesterday and today, uh, we'll be out in the, in the eastern panhandle tomorrow as well. Just a, a good good couple of days worth of hitting the campaign. There's been some personnel changes in uh, in your race recently, so you got a new addition. Uh, yep. I think everybody saw that news yesterday. J.B. McCuskey will now be seeking the same office as you. You're correct. Yeah, we had Mike Stewart in last week, and he made a point to differentiate himself from you and the rest of the field, and he's clearly trying to set himself up as the uh, most conservative candidate in the race, and the rest of you are, are just simply too moderate for West Virginia, he says. What do you think about that? I think that's his opinion. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a pretty good legislative track record. You know, I, was, I spent... One uh, one term in the House, and I'm now in my just finished up my seventh session in the Senate, and I think I have a pretty good tr uh, conservative track record. If you look at my voting record, you look at the positions that I've taken. You know, West Virginia, we have passed a, a number of conservative agenda items throughout the years, whether it be tax reform, tort reform, talking all of the the, the pro life bills that we have passed, and through all of that. For the past seven years, I've been a part of the, the legislative leadership team to put that agenda together and made that happen. I'm the majority whip. That means I'm on the leadership team in the Senate, I'm the, the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee. All of that doesn't happen in a vacuum. That happens with a leadership team that's willing to put those, those agenda items up for a vote and make sure that we've got the votes to do that. And as the majority whip, that's what I do. You want to be the next attorney general, and you cite tort reform. There has been some in the state. Can you highlight some of the major legislation that has changed some of those items? There was, you, know, you and I were talking before we came on there. Uh, we're both Duquesne grads, and I went to Duquesne Law back. I graduated in 2015 uh, after I came home from my deployment. And one of the things that I remember was I was still in law school when I got elected to the House of Delegates, and I was sitting you know, around the House Judiciary table, and we were talking one of the agenda items was the open and obvious doctrine. And I had just learned maybe three, four months beforehand that the open and obvious doctrine had been abolished in the United States and was no longer in practice anywhere in any courts. That was incorrect. West Virginia was still plugging away with the open and obvious doctrine. And what is the open and obvious doctrine? So if you went, to, let's say you went to the grocery store and there's a, a, a 12 foot open pit in the grocery, in the parking lot, and they got caution tape around it stay away, keep away, don't fall in this hole, and you're looking down at your phone and you keep walking and you fall right in the hole, you could still sue. Despite the fact that that hole and that the fact that you shouldn't fall into it was open and obvious and you still <laughs> fell into it, you could sue the grocery store. And so West Virginia was the only state that had the open and obvious doctrine. And so that was one of the things that, look, all that tort reform, we weren't out to you know, tip the scales in one direction, one way or the other, but we were just looking to have a, a, a level playing field. And by saying that we were still the, the only state that had something like that was we didn't feel was was a level playing field. And so there have been a number of things. I think, you know, the, the intermediate court, we now have a, an intermediate court of appeals. That was something that that was bipartisan. That was going back you know, years, well before I ever got in the legislature, that there was a commission that, to talk about that, to say that the one thing that West Virginia was missing was an intermediate court of appeals, that there there was no level between your circuit court and your Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And it was just, there was there were a lot of issues. And as an, as an attorney, I can tell you that there are a lot of issues, especially when it comes to being able to do a lot of research on behalf of a client. If, if you have a client says, hey, we might have this particular issue, or what's the West Virginia's current you know status on this issue? There isn't a whole lot of case law out there to be able to research because there are sicker courts don't publish their opinions. And so that our Supreme Court, if they turn something down, that means that there was never going to be a ruling on it, on an opinion that I would be able to research for, for a client. And so I think that was a good piece of work that we did. Um, and I think it, it's shown to be to be useful. And we were very careful in drafting that legislation. I mean, in the Senate, we launched it out over to the House, maybe three or four different sessions. So we had a lot of time to work on it, mm -hmm. refine it through the years. Uh, myself and, and our Judiciary Chairman, uh, Eastern Panhandle Senator Charlie Trump. And so I think that what we came to was a, a pretty good version of that bill, and, and careful to, to make a differentiation between the cases that went to the Intermediate Court of Appeals and went to the Supreme Court, especially when it comes to cases involving people's liberty or issues involving elections, things that need immediate uh, rulings. 
You know, uh, in regards to that open and obvious, I would have liked you guys to have written a uh, law corollary that went with that called the thin the herd law, which is if you're dumb enough to have your head into your phone and you walk into a 12 foot deep pit because you didn't have your head up. That's called thinning the herd. That's how we that's how we bring up the IQ of the rest of the population. Matt Miller. Well, open and obvious, okay, I could still sue, but it would sound like that case would not go very far. Do, do you know of results in, in any of those cases? I mean, or is it just a matter of the cost that it costs to a business to now have to defend that and so forth? Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's, anybody can sue on anything. I mm -hmm. mean, it, you can't stop somebody from filing a suit. But whether or not that action has merit and survives summary judgment up front, I mean, that's really where it, you're able to stop some of those lawsuits if there's no merit to them. And so that that's the the key is ensuring that again you can't stop and anybody can sue for everything, but ensuring that what we can do legislatively to ensure that that actions that have merit are the ones that move forward. You mentioned your conservative record as a legislator. How does that maybe give you an advantage, if you will, in this campaign? Well, it's not just my conservative track record. It's not just my conservative values that I then apply legislatively. It's how effective is someone as a legislator. And I think that's where I have shown over the past couple of years to be one of the most effective legislators in Charleston. If you look at, you know, I, I once heard that the marker of a, a good legislative session was that somebody got three bills done, that three of their bills that they were the lead sponsors of became law. If I go back to my first year, uh, I had to go look this up because I didn't know the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, I had seven. And over the past couple of years since I've been in the Senate, it's 67 total. And so if someone does three a year, then they'd have to be there a lot longer just to, to try to match that. And it's not just numbers because I, I never even understood that that was a, a, a marker of, of how someone measured their effectiveness. But what do the bills actually do? Are they just, you know, bills that, you know, might – improved the purchasing of a, the, you know, a department in the state because they came to an issue to run a bill. No, these are bills that actually help the people of this state. And, you know, since I've been in the legislature, I've focused a lot. I'm an Air Force guy. Before I came back home, I, I was deployed in Afghanistan. And while I was there is when I found out I got into law school at Duquesne. That's when I came home. And so I started out focusing heavily on veterans issues, as you can imagine. It's, a, it's something that's personal to me. But at the same time, when I got into the Senate, I was an assistant prosecutor in Brook County. And so then I started really getting into issues with dealing with substance abuse. And I found more often than I would have liked to that oftentimes those two issues were correlated. They were related. But then I also found that mental health issues was also involved. And so if you look at that, we'll call it the Venn diagram of veterans issues, substance abuse, mental health issues unfortunately, you know, came with the territory. And so those are the, the, the three areas that I kind of spent a lot of time focusing on, along with helping to reform some criminal law issues, because again, I was an assistant prosecutor and, and like to work in that area and like to work with the prosecutors around the state to get some things done. Through the AG's office, there has been a lot of work in relation to substance abuse in the state of West Virginia. Number one, your thoughts on the routes that they have taken, and number two, how you would like to continue that and, and even improve on that in that position. So I think that our current Attorney General, Patrick Morrissey, has done a, a tremendous job looking at these settlements over the past couple of years. You know, it's close to, I think, about a billion dollars at this point. And so this past session, we created what was called the, the West Virginia First Foundation because approximately, I think it's 72.5% of the money that has come in from those settlements is going to be dedicated to this foundation to then oversee expenditure of that money with certain guidelines in mind. And those guidelines are spelled out through the, the, the settlement document that, that created all of this and it's discussed in the legislation or legis the, the the bill as well. So our next attorney general is going to have to be someone that is experienced in that field because of the involvement that they're going to have with the West Virginia First Foundation. And I think that if you look at at, at, at my record on substance abuse, on mental health issues, I think I clearly fit that bill. Or this that money 
that settlement. Think about this, gentlemen. Opioid abuse, substance abuse, addiction is the greatest issue that we as a, a state face. I, I truly believe that because it's not just the individual who suffers from addiction. It's not just the person who's doing the drugs. But think of the, the second, as we in the military say, second and third order effects. So we've got all these kids in school that have a terrible home life because their parents are on drugs or they're being raised by their grandparents because the parents are in jail. And so now they're going to school and they're not doing very well because they can't concentrate because they probably don't get to eat as well as they should at home, which affects their academic performance, which then makes them more susceptible to substance abuse themselves. That creates, think of the, the foster care uh, problems that we have in the state. All of the kids that we as a state have a moral obligation to take care of. So all of that, this is a once in a lifetime, the only opportunity we'll have to, to repair all of the damage caused to the state by opioids through this foundation and the, the financial resources that it has. We cannot trust that off. Are you, are, will we as a state trust somebody to take on that role and be the next attorney general who has no experience working with these issues? I mean, it's, the stakes are way too high, and that's why I feel that I am uniquely qualified, not just in this area, but others as well, to be the next AG because of the work that I've done in substance abuse. And I've done a lot of criminal law involving you know, drug dealers and holding them accountable for what they do, transporting across you know, state lines our criminal narcotics conspiracy law that I had a couple years ago. But it's also my work in prevention and treatment that sets it apart. And so that's why I feel very strongly about running for AG. Jonathan Bodwell. Senator, let me ask. Um, you said, obviously, Patrick Morrissey, they've done a lot of fabulous things. What are a couple of things that you see that are changes that need to be made within the Attorney General's office that you've identified, things you want to do differently than, than what he has done? So it's not necessarily changes, but just different issues, Okay, we'll say. Um, you know, one thing that I, I had an op-ed a couple of weeks ago talking about artificial intelligence. And a lot of people worried, including myself, because I've seen the movie Terminator, yeah. uh, are worried about AI. And so I, I talked in terms of what the AG's office could actually do when it comes to protecting West Virginians from uh, any threats posed by artificial intelligence. And I'm not talking about issues like in that <laughs> film. But I am talking about like identity theft. So the AG's office is kind of a, a hub for protecting West Virginians from I, ID theft, whether before it happens and educating them on how to avoid it, but then what to do afterwards if it is, if you are a victim of that. So I talked in terms of, you know, deep, they're called deep fakes. I wrote about a woman in Arizona that got a phone call from her daughter that said she'd been kidnapped and that they were holding her for ransom and she was screaming and crying. Then a guy got on the phone and said, if I don't get a million dollars, I think it was a million dollars by tomorrow, I'm taking her to Mexico and you'll never see her again. And the woman knew she was talking to her daughter on the phone, except that she wasn't. She finally was able to realize that her daughter was on a ski trip with some friends and they finally got a hold of her and she was completely fine. But the criminal organization, whoever called the mother, was able to, to clone their daughter's voice. It only takes three seconds of someone's voice for an AI software program to be able to clone that. So we're all hoes here in this room because <laughs> we've all talked longer than three seconds. Fortunately, I don't have enough money to give anybody if they, <laughs> they want to kidnap somebody. And, and so then I talked about one of the, the, the biggest things that the AG's office does, even if it's not the most visible thing in the state, is the Consumer Protection Division. So think of it in terms of you get a roof done on your house last year, it comes with a five-year warranty, and then the contractor just blows you off when you have a leak the next year. You would go to the AG's office for help with that. So in a number of states have, have enacted legislation to empower their attorney general to protect their citizens because AI was being used in financial uh, issues, like lending, uh, whether to, to extend someone credit. And it was also being used when it came to, to housing as well. And the results, because it was purely AI with no human discrepancy, and it wasn't subjective at all because it was all AI, it was resulting in some discriminatory practices. And that's, and, and so states enacted laws to protect their people from being discriminated against purely because AI is making the decision. 
And so the second thing that I would like to do is I'm a city attorney in Wellsburg where I live. I probably spend three-fourths of my time dealing with dilapidated properties, trying to track down these owners, hold them accountable, get them into court, because they're unsafe for the community. They're also unsafe for first responders who have to, because there's criminal activity or if there's a fire. I mean, we, there are a couple of stories throughout West Virginia this year of, of firefighters who were hurt responding to a, a fire in a, in a you know, vacant property. I think that the AG's office could serve as a hub, as a resource for cities across this state to be able to set up the legal process by which you can do this. Because I spend a lot of time doing this. If I build the city of Wellsburg for every hour that I work this issue, it, it would just be an astronomical number. But not every, every town, every small county has that resource. And so what if they could call the AG's office and get the legal help, say, how do we build, set up a building enforcement agency? How do we hold these people accountable, get them into the courtroom? get these buildings down you know the legislature over the past couple of years we've uh, we've appropriated I think it's 30 million dollars for these kinds of properties to be torn down but if you can't even get the people to be held accountable and then the legal process because there are a lot of legal hurdles to get there to tear something down that you don't own even if it's so problematic in your community if, if you can't get to that step what good is it and so that's just a, a project that I think is important to me just to make our community safer and also to allow us to paint a better picture of our landscape. Senator Ryan Weld is our guest here, candidate for attorney general in West Virginia. We had Mike Stewart on last week. Uh, J.B. McCuskey, who recently switched from uh, being a candidate from governor uh, for governor to attorney general, uh, will join us uh, tomorrow on the program. Uh, Mike Stewart criticized your voting record uh, in regards to what he felt made you a moderate, not a conservative, Ryan. And on that note, Jeff Haddix has a question in regards to your votes for medical affirming care for minors. So we had a bill this past year uh, that would have banned, uh, you know, surgeries to, to you know, transition a, a juvenile from one sex to another. And so that bill came to us from the House and, uh, you know, I voted in favor of it. And we sent it back over to the, the House again and you know, they voted on it and took it up and passed it out. I mean, I, so. That, that was one of the questions from our Facebook community. Uh, another vote that you took, this is not political, but it had to do with uh, the transfer rule for players yes. in West Virginia. And uh, there was, I, I think, probably some coaches are against this. But by and large, there are a lot of folks who were in favor of giving kids the freedom to move uh, around uh, as they see um, a more appropriate situation for them. Can you tell us about that vote? So, yeah, so we had a, you know, several times the Senate passed out a bill that would allow for students in the state to have a, a one-time transfer um, in dealing with athletics because we were seeing instances across the state where kids were transferring for reasons that had absolutely no reason whatsoever to do with athletics, had to do with the, the school that they wanted to go to and, and didn't want to be at the school that they were currently at for there were smaller class sizes, academic programs that, that were offered at the, at the second school, and yet they were still being forced to, to sit out for a year. Actually, it, it was even dumber than that. They could practice, they could wear the jersey to school on game day, but they had to sit the bench during the game. And then it, if you drill down even further, it was even worse because if, if a student transferred from Maryland or in my neck of the woods from Ohio, you were good to go. You can go play immediately. Or if you transferred from a public from a private school to a public school, you could start playing immediately. But if you were transferring from a public school to a private school, you had to sit out. And so the, it was just a, a myriad of different rules, and, and it was like a Rube Goldberg operation. If I did this, but if I do that, if I stick here, but if I transferred here after the 12th day of my freshman year. And so it was, we just made it so that it was a one-time transfer and you could be retain your eligibility. Now, you can't, like, transfer mid-season. You get two games into or two practices into the basketball, and you say, this, I don't want to be here. I'm going to go play someplace else. You can't do that and then go play basketball at another school. So there, there are certain, you know, it's not just a, a free-for-all, but we just thought that it was much better off to allow for students to, to have, if, if, if parents had made a choice with their students, this is the right school for me to attend. Why is the SSAC inserting themselves into that decision making and say, you may think that's the right decision and that's fine, 
but we're going to punish you by forcing you to, to sit the bench for an entire year for exercising your, your parental rights. The SSAC takes a lot of money from the public, yet they appear to be above and beyond answering to the public and certainly the state. Yep. Is that right? Uh, no, I, I mean, I don't think it is right. They are, so their money in code is defined as being quasi-public uh, because they, they don't take any funding from the state, but they take money from the public. Uh, they also, I know they generate a lot of revenue uh, through advertisement and their contracts for, uh, you know, certain outlets to have exclusive rights to broadcast their games, that kind of thing. But we, you know, we had a bill uh, this past session to allow for the legislative auditor's office to audit the SSAC. Uh, that bill was, was ultimately vetoed for, for legal reasons by the governor, uh, rightly or wrongly, because there is case law talking about, uh, you know, what exactly makes a state agency and, and when does the state have authority over it and when does it not. Um, but, you know, there, the, the tax returns for the SSAC are, are online and the last year that they had up, it was 2019 or 2020, and they had millions of dollars in assets, but we just don't know how they spend and where they spend it. And I think that it's important for us to know because this is the agency that is in charge of all the athletics for our children across mm -hmm. the state of West Virginia. And so that's why I think what, what the, the impetus was behind that audit bill. But again, for whatever reason, it, it didn't make it across the finish line completely. Matt Miller. Is that a bill you see coming up again? It would be tough because, so the governor spelled out what the his objections were to it right. in the, the veto letter. And I, he did make some legal points about, again, when is an agency a state agency and when is it, it not a state agency? And there, there was a test that was used in a, a suit a number of years ago involving uh, O.J. Mayo, the basketball player, right. you know, former NBA player who was playing down in Huntington. And so they, they went through the, the elements of that test, if I remember correctly. And so it, it would take a, a, a much broader overhaul, I think, to come above those objections. Um, but that's the will of the legislature. Any final questions for Senator Ryan Well, Jonathan Bodwell? Senator, you had said you had 67 bills in the Senate that you got across. Can you just tell us one or two that, that you were the sponsor of, that you're, you're most proud of? Sure. So all those bills, those 67 were bills that I was the lead sponsor of. Uh, I think the first one is reinstating our Veterans Corps program across the state. We had had a, a Veterans Corps program, but that was it was then done away with by former uh, Chief Justice Alan Lawfrey. And, but then I, I mean, that was something that really bothered me. And so I worked with our cor current iteration of the court, and we brought that program back, and I'm very proud of the results that it's made. I was in Raleigh County a couple of weeks ago talking with their uh, one of the judges there and their chief probation officer, the successes that they've had with it. Uh, I, I think an, another one would be, you know, I mentioned the narcotics conspiracy bill, and that was a bill that uh, mirrors the feds. So it's not just your, your simple conspiracy law, but instead it is a graduated uh, sentencing based on the weight of the, the, the substance that you were dealing in. And it takes all the deals. So if I send you into town with an ounce, I send you into town with an ounce, and I send you into town with an ounce, that weight can then be collectively added up, and that adds on to the sentencing. And I know that prosecutors around the state have really started to, to use that to, to great effect, particularly in the border counties, obviously. Uh, there is one final question I have for you, Ryan. Should the Attorney General's office in West Virginia have a criminal jurisdiction, more so, more broad-based than it has now? Uh, no, it should not. So um, anybody that uh, has proposed that, what they either didn't know or wanted to ignore is that it's an actual unconstitutional proposal. The state of West Virginia's constitution and our courts are clear that the only authority to prosecute criminals lies with the county prosecutors. And so, A, it's unconstitutional. B, I don't think that we should be enlarging the bureaucracy of Charleston by taking away power of our locally elected officials, both sheriffs and prosecutors, to give the AG's office criminal investigative and criminal prosecutorial powers. Good to see you again. I hope you'll visit with us again next time you're in town. Thank you for having us. The inner sanctum in here. So thanks for, I appreciate it. Long way to go until the primary. Ryan Weld, attorney general candidate, Senator Ryan Weld. Uh, does your term end this time around? So it, in other words, if you were to lose, would you still be able to be a state senator or are you a double expiration? Nope, I'm either in the, the attorney general's office or I'm at home, back at home. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.